private advisor group, and nothing they say should be taken as investment advice, and nothing I say should be taken as medical advice. And I'll hand it over to Danny. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I'm Danny Bookbar, and thank you, Flora, for that introduction. I am president of Brazio and former CEO of Circle Line Sightseeing and president of the NFL Experience, where I had the pleasure of meeting you, David Baker. Look forward to hearing from you again and talking football. I live on the Upper West Side with a wife of 22 years and two teenagers. Over to you, Johnny. Hi, guys. My name is uh, Dr. John Bookvar, and I'm vice chair of neurosurgery at Lenox Hill Hospital, where I am right now on the corner of 77th between uh, uh, Park and Lex, as I do every week, uh, just to give you a little update on healthcare uh, as it relates to COVID and, and non-COVID. I'm always pleased to report uh, now that um, we have very, 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 very little uh, COVID uh, admissions. Uh, most of our hospitals are seeing zero admissions at night, which obviously, as you know, is just terrific news. Um, we are seeing uh, a, a massive reduction in the number of deaths uh, per day. Uh, Governor Cuomo uh, reported we have about 65 deaths, and majority of those are in uh, nursing homes as well. So um, most of our hospitals are actually seeing no new COVID patients admitted to the hospital uh, through our emergency rooms, or at least a, a handful. So that's the news on the admission front. Um, just from the scientific perspective, we're seeing new changes uh, and better treatments in our uh, approach to this disease. For example, this week, we know that the use of convalescent plasma, which is plasma that is derived from patients who have been exposed and convalesced or recovered from uh, COVID, if we use it earlier in the disease, uh, it works even better. So we're moving now to use convalescent plasma earlier. And as you know, uh, the drug remdesivir, which is a Gilead pharmaceutical drug, uh, has been shown to work better earlier in the disease. And now we're coupling that drug uh, with other new drugs, including IL-6 and IL-2 uh, uh, inhibitors. So I think um, we're all nervous about uh, opening up and, and seeing new peaks and new um, surges, but frankly, we're not nervous about it. Um, we're ready for it. Uh, we, we know actually new data now suggesting that we should not be intubating patients as early. So there, even if we get a new peak uh, in the fall, I think it's going to be a, a much easier to deal with. So I know Ricky Sandler's uh, uh, already signed in. So I'll turn it over to you, Peter, for his introduction. Ricky, thanks a lot uh, for taking the time and joining us. Um, definitely want to talk markets with you, but really wanted to start out with uh, the letter that you wrote a couple weeks ago, sort of highlighting your viewpoint that, that from here, we really have two choices as a society. And, um, and you obviously choosing one of those choices. So if you want to maybe uh, elaborate on, on those and, and what your thought process was and what really motivated you to, to, to be vocal and, and write about it and, and, and give your opinion on this. Yeah, sure. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Nice to see uh, all the book bars here. Um, along for, with, you, uh, for those of you who don't know, Ricky and, and I and, and Dan John, we all grew up together. Yeah. Um, so um, look, I, I, I think um, at, at the end of the day, I got, I got motivated because um, I saw several things happening all at the same time. One um, was uh, this, this became highly politicized in a way that is, is, is not scientific and, and not um, research-based, but, but frankly, politically based. And, and, and that scared me as an American. Um, two, um, I spoke to a lot of really smart, well-read people who I felt like still were in a little bit of a fog, but just trying to lift up their head and try to understand like, like how do we get through this? And, I, and then the last thing is I felt like 10 weeks in, like we need to zoom out and, and say, like how, how are we gonna get to the other side? And the other side metaphorically is how is your mom gonna make it to your daughter's graduation? Um, and, and, and not worry. And um, so, so, so those are the things going on. And I think um, I, I, I fear that um, uh, we've lost our true north as a, um, uh, as a strategy, as a nation. Um, I think, I think um, Dr. Bookfar talked about no new people walking into the hospitals yesterday. Um, as, as somebody who has an office in New York City, it's very frustrating to me that I still can't open my office for another three or four weeks, okay? That doesn't make any sense, but politicians, I think are part of the issue and, and, and maybe most that, that caution and compassion are really um, 
thoughtfully sounding strategies that we often get from doctors and scientists, which nobody can argue with ever. Take an extra week with that ankle before you go back to playing tennis. And, and, and that's never a bad thing. But we are in a situation where extra caution, extra compassion, um, or perceived compassion, because I, I, I don't want to, I, I, I believe that both strategies that I've laid out are compassionate strategies, okay? But, but cautious strategies, in, in a very direct sense, um, uh, I feel like have enormous costs that people are not thinking about. And maybe the, to, to end it, and then I'll, I'll move on, I think there is a misconception that we can distance our way out of this. That that it will we we can get it to zero as a country. It'll die and 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 we'll be okay. And 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 I fundamentally believe that that's not the case. That it will be back. And what we really need to do is understand that, be prepared for that, and 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 not necessarily be afraid of that. Which is this whole every time someone talks like, well, if we get a second wave, like like somehow that that's going to shut the country down again, and, and it should be very localized, and we should be very specific. If there is an outbreak in a county in Houston, that should be on lockdown. But in New York, we should feel like we do when the California wildfires happen, which is sad, and we watch it, and we we we, we don't feel great about it, but we also are not afraid to go outside. And 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 I think. Um, that's another an, another part of this is that, is that I've, I, I was really hoping to zoom people out and, and shift the focus of the conversation. And then I'll just end with, we, we did tweak our letter today um, in a way to soften something around herd, in, around herd immunity, which I think got us into um, too much of a visceral reaction with people. I, I, I never meant to suggest that we should throw people into a virus and, and, just, and just get them sick. Um, what I meant to suggest was um, those people that are comfortable going out and going outside back to life should be able to do that. Those people that want to protect should, and we should. So, so what I specifically changed was the second bullet point was um, now it, it used to read um, protect the vulnerable um, uh, uh, and pursue herd immunity. And, and now it reads protect the vulnerable um, and know that a, a combination of herd immunity and a vaccine will get us to the other side. Because they're, 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 they're two different, they're, they're two ways to get there, which is ultimately that enough people are resistant to the virus that it stops spreading, right? And that's what every scientist and doctor would, would sort of tell you. Um, and so I, I, I wanted to get away from the visceral because we've, herd immunity has been around forever and ever. And it's, it's how our parents dealt with the, the chicken pox when we were kids and, and how society's dealt with it. And, 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 and I actually think it's, it's a little ironic that we, 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 it's possible we could reach herd immunity at a number like 50% and we can debate about different things. I don't wanna get into it, but it is also ironic that maybe 50% of people that get this are completely asymptomatic. So, so not that we can per perfectly identify them, but, but there are things that we can do with people who are comfortable that help get to the other side. Um, and, and I also think that that is something that would have the least amount of chance for civil unrest. If you are, concerned and fearful or vulnerable, you should be 100% comfortable protecting yourself and wearing a mask and gloves and doing everything. But, but asking the rest of the country to do that, um, I think it invites a, a problem. And I actually don't think, I think if the rest of the country goes about the business and some people, we, we could build up a herd immunity that would be really positive towards getting us there with people who are comfortable doing it. So, um, that's where, where, where or, or I shouldn't say, pe people who are comfortable with the risk, right? Everything we do in life is a risk. I get on my bicycle every day and I take a risk. We get on a car every day knowing that, that we, we take a risk. Um, and, and, and that some other people might not even obey the law. Um, we, we, we know that all deaths in cars happen at a speed limit over 30, but we, but, but we still set the speed limit at 55 or 65 because that's efficient for society. So I'll, I'll stop now. Anyway, there's a lot there, a lot to unpack, but, but, but I wanted to just sort of lay out um, some of this debate and, and, and clarity so that I, because I, 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 I do feel like zooming out, we, we, we now, everybody picks up their head and says, all right, how are we getting through this? Yeah. Hey, J Johnny, from a doctor's standpoint, translate like the idiot's guide to Ricky's comments about herd immunity and, and the 50% just for, yeah, the, so for the listeners out there. So herd immunity is basically the way that a virus um, has infected enough people in the herd 
where it no longer has a host to seek and uh, essentially prey on. Usually the number for herd immunity is about 60 or 70%. And as Ricky said, it's debatable. But the way to get to, if you don't have a vaccine, remember a vaccine provides immunity and infection provides immunity. So like Ricky said, there are two ways to become immune. Either you get infected and you convalesce or recover, or you get a vaccine and you develop that immunity. Um, we know that we don't exactly know what uh, will happen with this particular virus and when herd immunity will be achieved. Of course, we also don't know when a vaccine is going to be achieved. And I remind people that, you know, HIV is a virus for which we have no vaccine. There's no guarantee that a vaccine is going to happen. And there's no guarantee that a vaccine is going to happen soon. Now, there are suggestions because we have other vaccines of similar viruses, but there are many viruses that we've had trouble uh, with vaccines. And of course, the influenza vaccine is uh, variable in its efficacy. So just because you have a vaccine doesn't mean it's effective. So there's legitimacy to what Ricky is saying about achieving that herd immunity. We want, we want to achieve herd immunity, however we get there. Uh, we just don't want to put our vulnerable populations at risk. And I echo what Ricky said is the vulnerable populations are the most at risk. So our parents and, and the infirm are the ones that really have to do the social distancing, wear the masks. And I will tell you this, mask wearing is imperative. If you want to, if you're within six feet of somebody and you're not wearing a mask, you're increasing your risk. If you want to, <coughs> you don't, you, you want to decrease the risk, wear a mask. And that, that, that should be um, uh, imperative. My personal opinion is that we're going to see a rapid, rapid drop in the amount of virus come July 1st. There's going to be an infinitesimally small amount of virus that circulates in July and August. Okay, And that some of that is the seasonality of the virus. And some of that is the flattening of the curve that we've seen. And some of that is because more and more people have been infected. Whether it comes back in September, um, with uh, some uh, legitimacy uh, is uh, worrisome because not all of us will be immune at that point. So um, I think that we have to get out. We have to um, obviously uh, not purposely infect our, our, our population, but there is going to be some creep and crawl toward this herd immunity whether until we get a vaccine. And Ricky, after you penned your letter, you know, what happened next? Well, actually, yeah. you know, what you said, what drove you to do it, and the response was was, uh, you know, tremendous. But give us what's happened since you penned it. Um, so uh, we 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 got a, a lot of very positive responses. Um, uh, we have uh, almost a thousand people have have signed the letter. We got a few haters and and some and some some uh, hate email and people who who think that I'm, um, you know. Uh, uh, a rich guy living in a mansion expecting everyone else to go out and get the virus. Um, when, when, when I myself am very comfortable being in, in any setting, I, I, I would like to go to a concert this weekend. I would like to go to a restaurant this weekend. Um, I wouldn't wear a mask if it wasn't required. I don't like doing that. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable taking the risk. So, but, but be that as it may, our, our, um, um, my next step is going to be adding content and links to the site. Um, one of the other points that I made on CNBC was that um, in addition to the politicians who were um, maybe being guided by doctors and scientists and caution um, is, that, is that the media has been um, on, on one side either wanting to sell eyeballs and therefore putting up the, the most um, grabbing headlines like, you know, coronavirus cases in New York rise to, you know, 26,000 when it was only up one or two in the next day. Like, like, but, but, but that's the kind of headline, plus the fact that Google and some of these sites are actually suppressing alternative opinion um, kind of sent me ballistic because that, that is, is the antithesis to what we are as Americans. And, and, and so um, I'm gonna put some links up on the site um, to articles um, and data that people can, can look at on their own because I want to try to get facts and data out there. I want people to be able to understand the risks that, that they might be taking um, in a statistical sense. Um, there is some very interesting data around a surprisingly large, not susceptible population, um, i.e. people who, who would, won't get the virus no matter what. Um, I, I possibly could be in that myself because I've been living in a house with two people with COVID for five weeks and never got the virus and never 
didn't distance. And, and when you look at the data on either the Princess cruise ship or the Navy destroyer, which were the two enclosed environments, it, it, it could be that, that 30 to 50% of people are not susceptible to it, which would lower the percentage of herd immunity that we actually need of, of infected people. So that, that's why herd immunity could be 80% and, and, and it could be 30 or 40%. And um, we may be at 10 now or eight. I don't, you know, in New York, there's a, there's a chance that we are quite close to it in New York City. Okay, I, I, I'm not, you know, I, I, I just a chance. There's a lot we don't know here and I, and I respect that. And there's a lot we don't know with either path we go. And I think, uh, you know, the, the, the doctors in the room can, can, can tell me this. I, we sometimes look for precision with medicine, but it's not always so precise. Um, exactly the diagnosis, what we do, we try things. And, and I think this has got people scared enough that people are a little deer in the headlights looking for the answer. And, and there are unknowns with every way we go. There are risks and consequences with every way we go. And I want people to understand that. Let me just echo a little something that Ricky mentioned. I think it's important for lay people to understand. There is a receptor in your lung cell called the ACE receptor that the virus requires to infect that cell. And we found out actually in a paper um, this week <clears throat> or last week that many children lack that receptor. So there is validity to the point that not everyone is susceptible to this virus. And that, that level of susceptibility depends on the level of receptors in your what are called pneumocytes or the cells of the lung. And again, these are unknowns. We're, we're, and of course, everyone is motivated, motivated initially by fear. Um, and I try to get my own mother out, out, of the, out of the house and to come over, but it's, it's not always easy, um, but we all have a genetic susceptibility that is undefined right now. And if you're anxious about it, wearing a mask, socially distancing, sanitizing your hands, um, but it's okay to get out, go to the stores, uh, frequent restaurants um, when, it, when the time comes. So um, we, we, have to, we do have to get to the other side. Uh, yeah, Ricky. So one thing I forgot to tell the audience, Ricky is the, the founder, the CEO, the CIO of, of, of Eminence Capital, which is a New York based hedge fund. Uh, Ricky and I, I think we spoke, was it like late March, early April, right near the depths and, and you were you know, very vocal and, and the timing was amazing on, on saying that this is just way, way overdone. Now that we've come so far over the past couple of months, uh, what's your you know, most updated thoughts on, on, on the market? Is it too much? Do we need to, to, to see a more deeper recovery in order to sustain this, where you think that that is to come over the next six to 12 months? So there, there are um, a couple of ways to answer that question. First of all, the market as defined by the S&P is one element, and you know this, um, which large, large cap companies, increasingly dominated by technology for good reason. These are, these are wonderful companies. Um, so the market and um, lots of stocks could be a completely different um, answer to you. And, and what I would say is for the market overall, um, I believe that um, we've recovered as much as I would think uh, uh, makes sense given the real damage to the economy. And, and, and there is more risk to the downside than the upside um, as a result of, a, of a, several things that are, that are at play once we get past this, this first ramp. And so I, I have said that, the, that the, the people talk about L, V, W, shape of the economy, and I've said square root sign, which is it looks like a V until you're some point away, and then, and then it sort of flat lines. And there are flat lines for a lot of reasons. Unemployment's gonna stay stubbornly high because everybody figured out how to be more efficient. Um, international um, uh, emerging markets, some of these places, don't have the ability to print and put money in people's pockets the way we can. And so there's some, some, some risk there um, uh, globally. Uh, I, think, I think there is risk of uh, the election once we get beyond uh, the next month or two, people start talking about if we have a democratic sweep, that is not gonna be positive for the market and that is certainly a po possibility. So um, I, I think there are a lot of growing risks here that um, tell me the market overall I think has more downside than upside, let's say over the next three to six months, but I'm not bearish. Uh, I think there are lots of companies underneath the surface, um, more of what people would describe as durable value, let's say compared to quality growth that are, that are quite interesting return opportunities here in a myriad of, of, of outcomes for the economy 
and um, and 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 there is a notion that that I think business cash flows are still an attractive place to invest in if you're looking for some return. Um, whether you own a business, you buy private equity, or you buy stocks. That uh, makes a lot of sense. Well, Ricky, thank you so much for your time. Thank really you. appreciate thank it. And um, yeah. thanks for having me. Thank and yeah. have a great thanks, weekend. Ricky. Good to see you guys. Thank you, high school. you too. Thank yeah. Thanks, Ricky. <laughs> All right, we're going to shift gears a little bit, and now we're going to uh, uh, move from talking personal finance to our health and uh, summer, and like to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Hale. Thank you. Hello, Liz. How are you? I think you're on mute, so I'll do a sound check if you can unmute, uh, but I'll introduce you right. while you unmute. There you go. I'm How great. Doing, Thanks for having me. Well, welcome. So Dr. Elizabeth Hale is a board-certified dermatologist and clinical associate professor of dermatology at NYU. You specialize in uh, Mohs micrographic surgery and cosmetic dermatology, laser surgery, and you teach advanced dermatologic surgery uh, at NYU. You also have extensive experience in the field of skin cancer, and you're a longtime advocate for increasing public awareness uh, about skin cancer. So welcome. And uh, I do know that you and Johnny have uh, worked quite a bit together. Uh, so welcome to the show. And we want to talk about, um, you know, as Johnny and Ricky and all of us are talking about getting out and about this summer, obviously protecting ourselves and particularly protecting our skin is increasingly relevant. So, you know, start with that. What do you tell somebody, you know, who's been inside for 11, 12 weeks, um, chugging vitamin D because they haven't been allowed in the sun? You know, what does a dermat dermatologist tell them next? So we're certainly glad that people are starting to get outside. And as Ricky talked about, I agree. I think we have to be careful, but we do have to start living our lives and getting outside. But as dermatologists, I like to remind people that skin cancer is the most common cancer diagnosed in the United States. And it actually is more common than breast cancer and colon cancer and lung cancer and prostate cancer all combined. So it's thought that one in five Americans will get skin cancer at some point in their lifetime. But the good news is, and what makes skin cancer so unique because it's so visible and because patients often can detect it on their skin, it's often almost always curable when it's caught early. However, we know that about 90% of skin cancers are associated with exposure to the sun and unprotected exposure to the sun. And that link has actually been proven now to be even stronger than the link between smoking and lung cancer. So we know that unprotected sun exposure causes more skin cancer than even smoking does with lung cancer. On top of that, half of what I do is skin cancer. The other half is people who come in and they want to rejuvenate and they want their skin to look healthy and younger. And about 90% of the signs of skin aging are also associated with unprotected sun exposure. So we try to educate people. Skin cancer is so common, but it's also almost preventable if you know, if you're wearing sunscreen and practicing good behaviors, and even when you get it, if you get in and get your skin checked, if we catch it early, it's almost always curable. But the best thing to do to protect your skin is to get in the habit of wearing broad spectrum sunscreen every day. And I think the most surprising thing people have learned from me over quarantine, while we're mostly spending our time indoors, um, we still actually need to protect our skin when we're inside because we're sitting in front of these screens all day. Zoom has become the new normal in addition to ultraviolet rays, which can penetrate through windows, we're also exposed to HEV light and blue light emanating from our screens. So it's a good idea to get in the habit of wearing a broad spectrum sunscreen daily. And as you mentioned, now that we're finally gonna start getting outside as some restrictions are being lifted and the weather's warmer, it's tempting to think, oh, I deserve it. I, I don't need to protect my skin, but that would be a mistake and everyone should wear a broad spectrum sunscreen. So can I just ask, reiterate an important point? Even in quarantine, you suggesting wearing a sunscreen That's indoors right. for your entire body? Not for your entire body, but for any part of your exposed body. Okay. So usually that would mean face, neck, decolletage, in this case, shoulders and arms, or otherwise, you know, backs of hands if you're wearing long sleeves. And that's because there are two main types of ultraviolet, lay, ultraviolet rays that reach the skin surface. So there's ultraviolet A and ultraviolet B rays. There's also ultraviolet C, but that's such a small uh, negligible amount. So when we think of going to the beach and wearing sunscreen and we look at SPF numbers, that actually refers to the ability to block a sunburn, which we of course know is very bad for our skin. But more prevalent year round are ultraviolet A rays, UVA, 
And ultraviolet A rays are unique because they're actually longer wavelength. So they have the ability to penetrate through clouds on a cloudy day, but they also are shown to penetrate through windows. So this is why we recommend wearing sunscreen even when we're indoors, because a lot of us are set up near windows, you know, we're craving that outdoor light. Ultraviolet A rays can penetrate right through. And then as I alluded to, the blue light and the HEV, and they're, they're, we don't know exactly the types of mutations occurring yet, but there are new thoughts that visible light, blue light and HEV light can age the skin and potentially lead to skin cancer mutations as well. So we wanna always be protected. I'm gonna jump on two more questions. And um, just tell me a little bit about your office practice during COVID and what are your expectations? Are you concerned about people who are delaying their skin checks, their body checks? Are you seeing an uptick? What are your recommendations for people uh, to come see you for those skin checks? I'm so glad you asked about this because all of us I know are, are ready for this quarantine to be over, but I've been reading so much about some of these secondary losses that are occurring. You know, a lot of people talk about mental health and drug addiction and suicide increases, children who are not getting vaccinated, but something I'm particularly interested in is the delay in cancer diagnoses across the board because people, I practice in New York City, so we were closed um, since March 17th and we just opened very selectively to treat skin cancers. But, you know, skin cancer is the perfect example because skin cancer is so reliant on early detection and when things are caught early, they're almost always curable. If people aren't coming in to get their skin checked, we're missing that window of opportunity to diagnose skin cancers when they are still, still curable. And I read a few weeks ago, there were already 80,000 breast cancer diagnoses, and I'm sure that number is way up. I'm sure that's an underestimation, but people aren't going in for their mammograms and for their colonoscopies. So I'm encouraged that things are opening up. I do think these are medically necessary. I know it's been a struggle. You know, I'm in practice with my sister and we were closed. We're a small business. We were closed for a long time. We opened up specifically because people were, because dermatology is so visual, people were sending me pictures of changing moles and new spots that were bleeding and crusting. And at a certain point, you can't, you can diagnose maybe over telemedicine, but you can't treat those. And we know it's so important to treat skin cancer while it's still early. So we opened up to deal with these suspicious lesions, to cut out some outstanding skin cancers. We had biopsied before quarantine, and now we're you know, trying to get back into preventative health, which as you know, is so important. Uh, Dr. Hale, uh, this is Peter. Just a, a question. When the average person Googles COVID or, or how to sort of protect yourself or vitamin D is, is something that obviously pops up. And if they're not going outside and getting it through the sun, you know, they're taking a supplement. It, it, does that even work? I mean, is, is that, I mean, obviously it's not the same as, as the sun, but is there any effectiveness to that? It's better than the sun. Okay, so I'm glad you asked. And I do think um, vitamin D certainly is one of the most important vitamins for overall health, potentially for COVID and for bone health, uh, vitamin C and zinc. So those three, vitamin C, vitamin D and zinc are three things I have been recommending. There's a great misconception about the role of sunlight um, as far as the importance of vitamin D. So again, unquestionably, it's very important to get your vitamin D. However, only a very small proportion of the vitamin D that we have active in our body is from sun exposure because the sunlight helps to convert an inactive form of vitamin D to a more active form. However, there are many studies documenting that even wearing sunscreen, people still sort of max out on the amount of conversion that can occur from the sunlight. It's really a small percentage. A much safer way to get vitamin D is through a healthy diet, vitamin D fortified foods, including you know, milk and leafy vegetables and salmon. Um, also, if potentially you are deficient, talking to your internist about potentially taking a vitamin D supplement. Uh, I always tell my patients, I myself, I've been wearing sunscreen every single day, 365 days a year, probably for 15 to 18 years, and I've never been vitamin D deficient. So there are certainly other healthier ways, but I agree with you, Peter, it's very important vitamin. Thank you. Liz, I have a trick question, and, and I hope you're not angry. Uh -oh. um, there is a COVID dermatologic uh, condition we're seeing in children. Have you seen any of this where rashes may be seen in, in this um, pediatric multi-system inflammatory disease in children? I know you may not have. Well, I don't specifically treat children, although I've certainly had friends send me pictures of COVID toes, which is like one small manifestation of the more widespread picture you're referring to. 
What we do know is that COVID does cause widespread inflammation, specifically in blood vessels throughout the body, which is why I think there's been more focus now on cardiovascular and other issues as opposed to just the lungs, which is what we thought initially. So how that manifests in the skin is something called vasculitis. So when you see inflammation of blood vessels, you can actually present with certain types of skin rashes that include um, reddening or purpling. Um, and because the blood vessels in the toes are so tiny, it's actually oftentimes where that rash might first present. COVID toes are sometimes a later presentation of COVID. So maybe a few weeks after a child was sick, or an adult was sick, they might get that manifestation. But the condition which you're referring to, which is more like Kawasaki disease, which is a dermatologic phenomenon also associated with other organ system, kidney failure, et cetera, that is a very rare condition. And yes, it was concerning when we saw a spike in those cases in children, because previously there weren't many children being diagnosed with COVID. I think it's important that parents realize it's still extremely rare. And of course it's frightening, but um, there is good treatment. I think most of these patients, and there still aren't too many, but most of them did receive intravenous immunoglobulin to help correct that condition. You know, so I just think it's important to be aware in this time of COVID, if, you, if your child has a fever, has a rash, has other symptoms, make sure to check it out with your pediatrician. But I think people should be assured that it's extremely rare phenomenon. Fantastic, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Liz. And I have one important question to, to wrap up. Uh, can you explain to Ricky and Peter in particular what décolletage is? <laughs> you don't know? No. The décolletage, yeah, it uh, refers to the area, the neck and the chest sort of where they come together. And the reason uh -huh. it's a great import to a dermatologist is because a lot of people come in and they talk about their face and they're good about wearing sunscreen and even if not makeup and other things do have some SPF people tend to neglect their neck and their chest. And oftentimes it is the first area to show signs of sunburns and aging. And interestingly, it's because there are no hair follicles in women in this area and stem cells in the skin reside in hair follicles. So areas that don't have hair tend to age more poorly and tend to burn more easily. Men are somewhat protected. So maybe that's not why you didn't know what the décolletage is, but we all have one. Well, that was a spectacular answer and wraps up a great Great chat. Thank, thank you, Dr. Hale. So good to have you. And uh, with that, um, I'm going to transition to David Baker, our final guest. And um, welcome, David. Danny, good to be with you and Peter and the doctor. All right. Well, uh, David, uh, you need no introduction, but I will give you one anyway. A man of strong decolletage. Decolletage, Liz? Is it well, a, big a big one, anyway. A big one. Very big. You, you are president of the Pro Football Hall of Fame since January of 2014. Um, under your guidance and leadership, the Pro Football Hall of Fame has greatly expanded programming across the country, which is how you and I met. It's been uh, since 2018, it was voted the best attraction for sports fans by USA Today. Uh, fun fact, before this, in addition to being an attorney, you played professional basketball in Switzerland. So we want to hear- 50 pounds ago. 150 pounds ago. Um, so what got you into football? Well, <clears throat> like I said, right now I'm probably, uh, a after this lockdown, probably about two dozen Twinkies over 400 pounds. Uh, <laughs> and, and I probably always should have been a football player. Um, but frankly, um, my mom and dad uh, couldn't read or write. And uh, sports was my entree to college and then to law school and then around the world and to meet people like you. And um, I was too big to play football because out in California, they would weigh you. And I weighed too much to play with other kids my age. And I, I wasn't tough enough to play with the kids that were five years older than me. So by the time I got to high school, I was pretty good at basketball. Uh, now in this next generation, I always loved football the most. and loved, They let me play flag football and loved that. Uh, but in this next generation, I had one son uh, that played at USC when they were winning 35 straight, and he was a three-time All-American there, and he played with the Falcons for uh, eight years. And, and I had another son who played at Duke when they were losing 22 straight. Now, both of those were NC2A records, and when we had dinner, uh, we had the winningest record in college football and the losingest college okay. record in college football. But what I loved about it, uh, frankly, Danny, was that both kids were learning great lessons, uh, how to be a teammate in life. And how to commit yourself to something that's bigger than you are. So um, I, I then got involved as an attorney and 
made enough money, thought I could get involved in pro sports. So I bought an arena football team. Um, I, I went to see, uh, I became the commissioner of the league. I went to see my counterpart, uh, Paul Tagliabue, who we're enshrining this year at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Yeah. He introduced me to his young right-hand guy, a guy named Roger Goodell, and we became very good friends. And uh, so when this opportunity came up, uh, I was doing something else and actually was uh, the managing partner of an integrated health village in Nevada that we were building. Um, but frankly, it, it is the greatest job in the world and had to do it. That's great. Well, welcome. Um, what are the plans for the Hall of Fame? I know it's been a rough couple of weeks, but we're, we're pivoting into football season. So what are the reopening plans? Well, you know, it's interesting because in its uh, in nearly 60 years of existence, uh, the Hall of Fame has never been closed two consecutive days. And as of now, it's been closed for about three months. And, um, you know, that's been a, a challenge for us, and I, just like it has been for everybody. Uh, it, what's interesting is this not only affects the Hall of Fame, it affects the NFL, and it affects the businesses of all those owners of those clubs in the NFL. Um, so... We're not unlike anybody else. Uh, we've had great conversations with our healthcare officials, uh, Dr. Acton here in uh, Ohio and um, Governor DeWine, who's done, a, I think, a real good job here, uh, kind of recognizing things earlier. But I think we're looking to open up now between sometime between next Monday and June 15th, uh, oh, really? probably June 15th or sooner. And, and uh, we have, you know, kind of gone around, and gotten the best practices uh, from all of that. And uh, it, it is, I mean, frankly, uh, going through the Hall of Fame is a lot easier uh, than going through Costco, to be honest with you. Uh, we have one-way traffic. We have timed entries. Uh, people are masked. You wash your hands. Uh, there's touchless hand sanitizing stations. Uh, you're given a, uh, a stylus that's disposable that, um, you know, you can use to touch interactive exhibits and throw away when you're done. But I think from our calls and from everything else, I mean, we've been, uh, you know, we, we've been overloaded on science that we needed to learn. And we've been uh, kind of deluged by fears and panic. And what we're seeing is that I think there's a lot of people that are looking for some inspiration. Uh, you know, in museums and culture, um, they may not tell you how to do something or, but they, they tell you why we do things. And, uh, and I think that people are looking for that motivation and inspiration. David, what do you, what do you plan on doing in light of the circumstances uh, with the next induction ceremony? You know, good point, because uh, we're in the business of aggregating and bringing people together. Uh, we've been in uh, kind of great uh, contact with other leagues that are going through the same thing. My son is a, a director of broadcasting at NASCAR, and they've already had six races. Uh, now, they've been only drivers and teams <clears throat> and production personnel. But for them, that's about a thousand people, you know, that are coming together. Um, here in Ohio, they just said that you're allowed to have weddings of 300 together. So now, so the answer to your question is, I don't know. Uh, you know, uh, we, we, we evaluate it every day, but as uh, Dr. Bookvar, you know, kind of alluded to, we know so much more today than we did 30 days ago. And, you know, what are we going to know 30 days from now? Now, our big event that really gets about 700,000 people to descend upon this town, and it's a, it's a big one this year because this is the 100th birthday of the NFL. Last year was the 100th season. This is the birthday year. And, and so, um, you know, we have the Dallas Cowboys and the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers. And, and understand that I think it was on March 11th, Wednesday night, that the NBA um, – March Madness, uh, NASCAR, uh, and Spring Baseball all shut down that Wednesday night. Our tickets were already predetermined to go on sale on Friday morning at 9 o'clock for this game, so I was pretty concerned. But they still, in the face of all that, sold out in 22 minutes, uh, which is incredible. And, and I think we've had just a handful of people ask for refunds. Um, but we're not going to do anything unless it's safe. Uh, the NFL's official position is that they're going to play a full season and they're going to get started on time, uh, which means getting started in Canton, Ohio, where we kicked off every season. But having said that, uh, you know, I think they have contingency plans and we have contingency plans. 
that might mean moving our game back some uh, a, a couple weeks or back to September 17th, which will be the centennial. And it even includes a plan that may mean that we do it all next year and have two enshrinements together. Now that next class and coming in 2021, uh, it's got a guy named Peyton Manning in it. Uh, so it would be a heck of a way to kick off next year. But we're going to make sure that it's safe and we depend on that on our healthcare officials, uh, both at the state and county level. Uh, we depend upon our governor here, Governor DeWine, and we depend upon, obviously on the NFL. But I, I think everybody wants to play. Uh, they're ready to play. And um, I think there's going to definitely be an NFL season. It just is a question of how many fans are in the stands. David, um, fun fact, and John, then you can ask a question that um, when we grew up, Peter and I were Cowboys fans and Johnny was a Steelers fan. So, you know, at least for Johnny and I, it was, it was always, he rooted for Terry Bradshaw and I rooted for Roger Staubach. Johnny, over to you. Um, Any comments on that? No comments. Lynn Swan was my hero. Um, David, so I, what is, I can see the, the Pro Football Hall of Fame opening you know, you're just going to have to wear a mask and you may have to be socially distant and you're going to maybe do a temperature check at the door. And there's maybe a, a capacity limitation in the beginning, but is that financially feasible to, uh, to continue operations at, without, you know, diving into your business model, but what is the capacity that you are capable of doing before you have financial ruin? Yeah. You know, doctor, that's a great question because I, I'll tell you, the answer is it's more financially feasible than staying closed. Right. But it's not financially feasible enough to sustain you on the long term. So like anything else, we got to get started someplace. Uh, I, I think the bigger question is, and this relates to all the NFL, and frankly, matter of fact, all sports is what's financially feasible in having some fans in the stadium. You know, uh, we have a stadium that is a, a truly a, a great NFL small venue. It's 23,000 seats, but is NFL in every other way. But if you're in a situation where you have one fan for every six feet, you know, the capacity for that stadium is not 23,000, it's 3,000. Now that's not very financially feasible. Uh, there are places like uh, the Indianapolis 500 that's looking right now at, can you cluster the ticket buyers together? Because generally they're families. Here in Ohio, for instance, uh, the restaurants are opening up and you can have up to a family of 10 eat together as long as that cluster is six feet away from somebody else. So if you did your fans that way, you might get up to five or 6,000, but it, it, it's still not the same as having a full stadium there to root for, by the way, the Cowboys and the Steelers this year uh, at the Hall of Fame game. Um. Don Shula was from Ohio, wasn't he? Yeah, he sure was. Yeah. So it must have been a, a an, and he's already obviously been inducted, was inducted to the hall. Yeah, he is the greatest coach in, in history, certainly the most winningest coach. And, uh, you know, losing him uh, at the age of 90, by the way, uh, was tough and uh, did a lot of radio interviews and TV interviews on that. But, you know, the, the, the thing I'll remember the most about him is how his other players remembered him. Um, he, uh, you know, he, he, he was in a situation one time when he and I and Bob Greasy were having dinner. And um, every time coach needed something, Bob was jumping up for it or holding his chair or coach, do you need something else? I'll go get it. And, you know, kind of as the night went on, there was a moment where Bob and I found ourselves alone. And I said, hey, I got to tell you, I just thought it was so endearing as to how you took care of Coach Shula. I, I, I mean, I wouldn't take care of my own mother that quite that well, and I'm ashamed to say that, but he admit that much to him. And he, he looked at me and he said, well, you know, he took care of us first. And, and, and it was something that was so special uh, to hear from a Hall of Famer like Bob Greasy. And, and they had a great relationship with him. Uh, he was clearly a great coach, won Super Bowls with two teams. Um, but, uh, you know, just the other day, Larry Little, uh, you know, one of their Hall of Famers from the Dolphins was telling me a story about them putting a, a baby alligator in Coach Shula's shower. Now, I can't imagine anybody doing that to Coach Belichick these days, uh, but th he was 
here it was 50 years ago from doing that, and Larry was just laughing so hard. But I'll, I'll conclude with one more story, because there's so many about him. But Coach Shula was a really devout Catholic guy. And um, he, he told me a story. He told me many stories, but one of them I always thought was amazing. He said that um, he was pulling up to a gas station in his dad's pickup truck, and his dad was a fisherman on Lake Erie, and Coach Shula would get very seasick. Uh, but he was graduating from high school and figured he was going to have to be a, a fisherman. And um, as he pulled up to that island, on the other side of the island, somebody pulled up, and it was the coach from John Carroll University. And he knew Don from uh, playing high school football. He said, what are you going to do? He says, well, I've got no offers. I think I'm going to have to go uh, be a fisherman on Lake Erie with my dad. And the coach from John Carroll said, well, I got one half a scholarship. And he said, if you want it, you can have it. And Coach Hula looked at me and says, can you imagine if I don't pull up to that island at that gas station at that time, I'm not the winningest coach in yeah. football history in the NFL. But he then added, he says, but I promise you, I would have been the best damn fisherman in the world on Lake Erie. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And I think you would have been. That's great. Well, you, you make your own luck too. So what a good story. Um, David, thank you so much for joining us um, and, you know, sharing the values of football, which that story really epitomizes and also sharing how to, how it's going to recover both the Hall of Fame and football in general. So thank you so much for coming. It's good to see you again. Liz, thank you for helping us kick off the summer healthily. Uh, we're all looking forward to getting outside. So we needed that uh, update on how to treat for our skin, treat our skin. And Ricky, thank you for sharing. Uh, your macro views on the economy uh, and uh, and your position. So really thoughtful and, and great to see everybody. And Johnny and Peter, we'll uh, catch up again next week. Everyone, thanks for coming and thanks, have everyone. a great week. Thank thanks, you. everyone. Thank have a good weekend. Have a great weekend.